Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. It's an honor for me to speak in this Congress. I was hoping there's a chance to visit Argentina on this occasion. Unfortunately, this didn't happen. I hope to have a chance to visit Argentina in the future. So today I will talk about the compactness of conformally compact Einstein manifold. And I will explain the title later. This is a report of a series of joint works over the last four or five years with my co-author Yu Xingge at the University of Toulouse, France, and Jie Qing at UCSC. And recently there's another young uh, postdoc joining us, that's uh, Xiao Sang Jin from China. So let me explain by uh, the discuss the problem which uh, is the main thing of this uh, lecture. And the problem is given a manifold, say compact, closed without boundary, and I call it D minus one dimensional manifold with a metric edge. And the question we ask is, when can we fill it in? That is, uh, when can we find another d-dimensional manifold such that this m is the boundary of x? But uh, in the following sense, suppose we x d already with this uh, metric g plus. This is a uh, Einstein metric, which we will explain later, and H is related to G plus in the sense that there exists a defining function such that this R, R square G plus restrict to H, to restrict to the boundary M is the given H. That's called conformally filling in. And in this case, we call M the conformal infinity of X. So this is a problem which is studied in the mathematical physics community as the ADS CFT correspondence. And it's uh, first proposed by Matasina and Witten. But in geometry, this also corresponds to the problem of studying the structure of asymptotic hyperbolic manifold. It turns out such a manifold X is naturally asymptotically hyperbolic. So it's also a question well studied in differential geometry. So here is the outline of my talk. First, I will give an introduction explaining the notation and a brief survey of the subject. And then I will begin to talk uh, the compactness of such manifold and the way it is set up. And then uh, the main result I will report today is a compactness result, but it's a perturbation compactness. And a perturbation uh, means uh, you perturb at a conformal infinity from a standard metric and a uniqueness theorem. Okay, we will report. And then uh, one of the main ingredients in this uh, result is uh, the study of some particular compactification, which we call adopted metric, and which is related to a curvature in geometry, which we call Q curvature. And then I will give a brief outline of the proof of theorems in section three above. And then if I have time, I will talk about a more general compactness result in a four dimensional manifold. Whenever I talk about dimension, I mean the dimension of the interior space. So this is three plus one dimension three on the boundary and three plus one in the interior. I will talk about a general compactness theorem. So that's the outline. 
So let me start by uh, begin a definition of uh, my talk. And that's uh, what's a conformally compact Einstein manifold. So if I have a manifold with boundary M, and then first we have a defining function. A defining function is a function which is positive on X is equal to zero on the boundary and such that this dr is not equal to zero on m, such like the distance, think about r as the distance from the interior to the boundary. And we call it is a conformally compact. If g plus itself is not compact, but distance function or defining function r squared g plus is compact. And we denote the boundary of R square G plus with C to M by H. So H now is defined in M. And in this case, we can see there are many different defining function R. If you have R and then you multiply it by a positive function, there can be another defining function. So H is not uniquely defined but it's defined up to a multiple of another positive function. So we denote this class by the conformal class of uh, uh, H, okay, of uh, G. So this H is the conformal class of H. And then uh, we call this boundary the conformal infinity of the original space. And usually uh, when we take this G plus to be an Einstein metric, then we normalize it so that it's really is minus D minus one G plus. In this case, we call it conformally compact Einstein. So this is actually Poincaré Einstein. This G plus is a Poincaré metric and we conformally compact it. So in this case, we have a triple. This is a conformally compact Einstein manifold. And in this lecture, I denote it by CCE manifold. So, and now, as I have mentioned, uh, for CCE manifold, there are many choices of the defining function R. But among them, there is a one which is particularly nice we call it a geodesic defining function. And this function is such that on the boundary, so here is M, here is X. On the boundary, this function is almost like perpendicular to the boundary. So that means this distance R with respect to the R squared G plus is one in a small neighborhood of M. So locally, it's like a product metric. That's called geodesic defining function. And it's known on a CCE manifold, such geodesic defining function always exists. And the problem is it's only defined in a small neighborhood of the boundary. And one does not know how to extend it inside. So here are some examples of CCE manifold. First, in the upper half space, Rd minus one and upper half space, and we take the standard Poincaré metric, dx squared plus dy squared. So dx is this direction, dy is the other direction. So dx and dy squared, and then this is a Poincaré metric, and then this uh, upper half space is not compact, but it's conformal to GH. The conformal factor is Y squared. If you times Y squared GH, then it becomes uh, the conformal infinity is the flat metric. And uh, the conformal infinity is just the Euclidean space. So this is not strictly speaking conformally compact, but it's conformal to an Einstein metric. And we will see this is a model case. And frequently in all these type of analysis, this is the blow up limit of a sequence of conformal compact Einstein metric. 
And the real example is uh, the space of the Euclidean ball with the hyperbolic Foncari metric, the distance function. And then in this case, the asymptotic infinity is the sphere. So sphere with the hyperbolic metric in the interior is a model case of Poincaré Einstein metric conformally compact Pon Einstein metric or CC manifold. So in this case, the geodesic defining function is chosen to be one minus y. So here this y means this distance. Uh, one minus y and one plus y, and then this geodesic defining function, and gc is the standard metric on the sphere. So hyperbolic, a Poincaré metric with sphere as conformal infinity is really the model case we have in mind. And there are other many famous examples in this uh, topic. Uh, I will not go into detail, but this Schwarzschild space is an example. In this case, the space is R squared plus S squared. And then we have this uh, Poincaré Einstein metric GM plus, which is uh, defined by this DT, DR, and GC. Okay. GC is a GC on S2, and DT, DR is the uh, coordinate on R squared. And this is the spherical co coordinate on R squared. And GC is the sphere metric. So here we have this uh, Einstein metric. And this V is a potential function, one plus R squared minus two M over R. I will not go to detail here. This M is really the mass of the space. And in this case, this uh, distance function, geodesic defining function R, is really defined only when V is positive. So there is a root of this function R. And then uh, there are actually two roots and then the uh, positive root, and this is where R is defined. And in this case, we have uh, the conformal infinity is S1 cross S2, okay? But uh, this example is also interesting in the sense that it turns out for given S1 cross S2, there are two choices of M such that this is defined. So given the same conformal infinity, there may be different conformal filling in. And that's the famous example of a Hawking page. Okay, and now I want to give a brief survey of what's known on the CC manifold, talk about the existence and non-existence result. So the question is, uh, given a boundary metric, can we conformally field in it in? But we do not know it's true, but there is this uh, uh, important work of Feynman and Grant in 85, where they construct ambient metric. And they say that we know at least in a small neighborhood of this M, there is a, com a compact. Einstein filling in, okay. On any there, it extends to a CCE manifold on a small asymptotic neighborhood of M. And they did it when H is a real analytic metric. And the result was uh, extended uh, quite recently by Gursky and Sakihidi when H is uh, just a smooth metric. And a second set of example is uh, Robin Grant and Lee, where they prove that, well, although we know that uh, the standard metric on sphere, it has the hyperbolic metric as uh, filling in, the result of Grant and Lee says, uh, if you put up H in a small neighborhood of HC, then you have a filling in. Okay, and the filling in they constructed is actually the interior is in a small neighborhood of the hyperbolic metric on the ball. 
Now let me mention some other very recent results that's by Gursky and Han and Gursky, Han and Strauss, where they constructed many examples of boundary conformal classes which do not allow filling in. Okay. And for example, they constructed a large class of such boundary. For example, if we are talking about sphere of dimension 4K minus one, but they need K bigger than two. For example, when K equal to two, we are talking about the seven dimensional sphere. And they say that there are many metric in this S4K minus one, which thus cannot be extended to Poincaré Einstein manifold on the 4K dimensional board. Okay. So S7 does not allow a B, does not allow a fill in in B4, B8 dimension for many class of metric. And this class of metric is with positive Yamabe invariant. That means positive scalar curvature. And the only thing I want to mention, the result is uh, uh, this uh, Atiyah Singer Patotis uh, index formula. And, and uh, one key point in the argument is based on an early work of Qin Jie and uh, Jack Li. That's the important work in this subject. The Jack Li and Qin Jie result says, if your boundary Yamabe class is positive, then if you allow conformal compact filling in, then the interior metric must be of positive Yamabe class. So if you have a boundary metric which has positive scalar curvature, then whatever you filling in, the filling in allow a metric in a conformal class of positive scalar curvature. So that's a unique existence result. Now I mentioned some uniqueness and then uniqueness result. The first uniqueness result I know of is a result by Qin Jie in 2003. And then there's a different approach by Dutta and Jawahiri in 2010, which they say that if the boundary metric is the standard sphere, then you have a unique interior falling in, and that's the hyperbolic metric. And this result was uh, recently extended, uh, given a more detailed and uh, insightful proof without using positive mass. The original result, Qin Jie, used the mass of the uh, result positive mass. And the uh, later result have a different approach by Li Qing and Xi. And now I want to report my own result, which I will report today uh, in this talk uh, about the uniqueness for D equal to four and uh, for D bigger than equal to four of the grand B metric. Grand B, remember for H in a neighborhood of the canonical metric, you have a filling in. And our result is to say the grand B filling in is unique, okay? So it's a perturbation result, but it's a uniqueness result. I will present the proof uh, today. And then uh, uh, let me repeat, let's uh, recall that in fact, we know that uh, there are examples such that given the same boundary, you have different fielding in. So the fielding in is by no means unique. So uh, given all this existence and then uniqueness result, and let me say the main open question in this subject is, does the entire class of metric on three sphere allows uh, with a positive scalar curvature allows in CCE fielding in in B4, okay, so, as we will see that uh, if H is close to the canonical metric on S3, there is a filling in. 
but what happened for arbitrary edge? And in this case, uh, we choose the three-dimensional manifold on, as the boundary because this class of metric on a three-manifold with positive scalar curvature is a connected set. It has a one component, connected component. This is the result of Marcus. This is not true for other dimension, but for three dimensions is true. And then also, if one look at the result of Gursky and Han, where they show there is no conformally filling in, their, their work, their argument does not work in three dimension. Remember, they need S7. Okay, they need the interior manifold to have some spin structure, but the S3 and B4 does not apply. So that makes this an open question. And uh, there are uh, very relative, they very few uh, progress, concrete progress on this uh, open question and it remain open. But today I will report some approach to try to approach this open question. And the, the problem we propose is the compactness problem. So we know that uh, 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 the filling in may not be unique. So there may be many filling in, but we want to see in what sense is the set of filling metric compact, okay? So more precisely, the question we propose to study is the following. Given a sequence of metric on the sphere, D minus one dimensional sphere, suppose the boundary metric from a compact set on the sphere. We start with a compact set on the sphere. And when can we fill in it in a CCE manifold so that on this uh, compact, on this uh, conformal class compactification of this uh, Poincaré metric, which we denote by GI, this forms a compact family on the ball. Okay, so that's the compactness problem. When does the compactness on the boundary imply the compactness on the interior? So, and now let me say, what's the difficulty of this uh, problem? The difficulty, the main difficulty of this problem I propose as above is that the existence of some non-local term, okay, so which I will explain now. So uh, let's return in the setting of four-dimensional CCE manifold. And now we have a, a infinity, boundary, which is three dimension. So in this case, if we take the geodesic defining function R, and then we look at the asymptotic expansion of G on the boundary. So this is for R small. And then we take its expansion. And then because this is a geodesic defining function locally, it's like a product metric. DR with something else. And this something else has asymptotic expansion. The first term is the boundary metric, R squared G plus restrict to the manifold. And then the second term, it turns out there's no R expansion. The next order term is R squared. The third order term is R cubed and so on. But it turns out G2, the information of the coefficient of the certain expansion is determined by H, by the boundary match, boundary, boundary metric H. So it's a, a combination of Ricci and scalar curvature of H. But the third asymptotic extension, the coefficient, is the Ricci of the metric G alpha, beta means tangential component and take the normal derivative of that, that's G3, okay? So this G3 is a non-local term. Non-local term means it does not decide it by H, by the behavior of H, but by 
the behavior of the metric on the entire extension inside. It's not a local behavior of edge which decide this. So the analog of this is like uh, in the, I, the problem for Laplace equation, we have Dirichlet data which correspond to edge. And then we have a Neumann data, which is uh, decided to say, if we talk about Laplace U equal to zero, and U restrict to the boundary is the Dirichlet data. And then DU, D normal is the Neumann data. And the Neumann data is an unlocal information. And this corresponds to our expansion G3, which is not determined by H. So the problem now we are facing is given H, which is a compact family, can we capture the compactness of G and capture some of the behavior of this local term? Okay. And uh, uh, let me remark that uh, although G3 is not determined by H, the work of Feynman, Graham, and Piqua actually indicates that given H and one knows G3, then one knows the rest of the coefficient. That G is determined by H and G3, at least in an asymptotic neighborhood of the manifold. So our main task is from the Dirichlet data, how do we get information on the Neumann data? Okay, and now uh, let me talk about how to further set up the compactness problem. And remember, we talk about asymptotic infinity, but uh, this uh, asymptotic infinity is re really decided up to a conformal class of H. And so the problem is within this conformal class of H, what is the data? a representative, a nice representative, one should choose when you say this family is compact, okay? And it turns that one particular good choice is uh, the Yamabe metric. Yamabe metric is the metric which we will talk about is uh, the scalar curvature equal to constant. So we know in HY, if uh, there is always a metric whose scalar curvature is a constant, we call it the Yamabe metric. So this uh, scalar means uh, some kind of second derivative of H and which is equal to constant. So that's a nice representative metric. And then when you talk about H is a compact family and you want to decide the compactified metric G being compact. And then one again asks oneself, what is a nice representative in G plus one should choose? One should talk about compactness. And a natural choice is the G Yamabe metric. And uh, actually uh, the Li and Qin result we talk about says if H is positive Yamabe class, then G Y is also positive Yamabe metric positive Yamabe class. So this is a nice representative match in a conformal class of G plus. But the difficulty of this choice is one does not know how to control the GY restrict to the manifold in terms of HY. You have a boundary Yamabe metric, you have an interior Yamabe metric, the existence both are solved by PDE problem, but you do not know how to relate the Dirichlet data GY to HY. Okay, so um, instead, uh, what we will do in this lecture is we will choose other representative in this conformal class, and which we will call adopted metric G star. So this G star is not G Y. And this G star metric has the advantage is given G star 
restrict to the boundary is my H1. Okay, I choose a soft some second order PDE such that this uh, boundary metric is fixed. And then I begin to talk about compactness of this family. We will explain a little bit more about how to choose this G star later. Okay. And now uh, let me say a few other words more about what's a natural setup of the problem. As the conformal infinity is determined up to a conformal class, so whatever condition on the compactness or any problem dealing with CCE manifold with a fixed boundary should be conditions on conformal invariant condition. Okay, so it should be regardless of the conformal metric you choose on the boundary, some quantity which is shared by the whole, every edge in a conformal class, conformal invariant condition. So a well-studied conformal invariant is the Yamabe constant, which you take the scalar curvature of any edge in a conformal class, you inf the integration of scalar curvature and you normalize by its volume. That's called Yamabe invariant. So our condition should be put on the Yamabe invariant. That's what I. But uh, uh, there are other conformal invariant which one can study. And Yamabe invariant is one which we call a second order invariant. It's a constant by second order because scalar curvature is a differentiated metric choice. But then there are other invariants. Uh, one invariant is the vial curvature. Vial curvature turns out to be a pointwise invariant. That is, if you change G theta to be E to W G, then the uh, vial for G theta is this uh, exponential minus two W vial G. And then from this, one also concludes that on a D-dimensional manifold, via to the d over two power in G metric and dvg is conformally invariant quantity. So we have another constant, which is a conformal invariant constant. And later on, we will see our choice of G star is related to a fourth order Q curvature, and that is coming from a fourth order invariant, conformal invariant, which induces a fourth order conformal invariant. So uh, we have second order invariant and we have some integral invariant which comes from pointwise invariant. And later on we will see there's a fourth order conformal invariant. So with uh, this setup, uh, let me at least uh, uh, state uh, the result which I want to cover today. And uh, the first result is what we call perturbation compactness result. Suppose we start with conformal infinity, which is sphere. And we want to have a XD, which is a CCE manifold with boundary X as conformal infinity. And on this CCE manifold, we have a sequence of uh, metric GI plus, which is all conformal Einstein compact metric. And then we impose count boundary uh, this, uh, on this conformal infinity. We think about this as Yamabe metric. So we assume this uh, sequence of bound metric on the boundary is a compact set, compact in CK alpha topology. And there is a detail, more detail when it turns out for D even and D R, there is separate argument. And so there is a different requirement of how large this is K, this CK alpha need to be. And then we require the Yamabe constant of this class, HI to be positive. So one is a good condition, all about the data. And then, 
we impose another condition, which is the either this another conformal invariant, the via to the d over two power to be uniformly small. There exists a delta naught such that this is small. This condition turns out to be equivalent to say the boundary metric has Yamabe class very close to the standard canonical metric, as you write GC, canonical metric homosphere. So either this or this, then the metric adopted metric, the representative metric we choose is a compact family. Okay. And then there's a detail about how compact this is in terms of the data given. So this theorem is nice in the sense that we impose condition on the boundary and then we impose some conformal invariant condition on the interior of this uh, conformal, this Einstein metric. Then we conclude the compactness of this uh, interior. So that means we recapture the Neumann data from the Dirichlet data plus this condition too. So that's uh, this uh, uh, perturbation result. We call it perturbation because it perturbs on the neighborhood where vial vanishes. And this theorem turns out to have a consequence and that's this uh, uh, grand Lee metric is unique. Remember that on the sphere, if H is in some C2 alpha neighborhood of uh, GC, then uh, you have existence of a uh, conformal compact Einstein metric. And our uniqueness theorem saying that Grand Lee's extension is unique. Okay, so it's a perturbation result, but pretend not only when H is the standard metric on sphere, but if H is perturbed in a neighborhood sphere, the unique the extension inside is also unique. Okay, so uh, let me remark, we say this result for D greater than or equal to four, but for D equal to three, then in that case, if our boundary is positive Yamabe class, then uh, by uniformization theorem, the metric H is already uh, diffeomorphic to S2. So on S2, there is uh, only one conformal class. So everything is unique just by the set of the problem. And also the interior space is a three-dimensional Einstein manifold but such manifold has a vial vanishes. So it's already a space form. So the interior extension is already the hyperbolic metric. So uh, this uh, compactness and the uh, uniqueness theorem all are true in this setting, naturally. So let me take a break here and ask, ask the audience if there are questions. Hello, I would like to take a, is this a nice time to have a break? Andrei? I'm unmuted now. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, sorry, sorry. The, the, if anybody has a question, maybe you can either raise your hand or put it on the chat or, or uh, maybe, um, Asked to be a mute, a muted. Any questions or comments? I think that there's none so far, so maybe oh. we can continue and wait to the end. Yes, thank you. Some time at the end. Okay, and now I will come back to explain. Uh, in the condition of the theorem, I really say there is a one class of representative metric, which is compact, as we call adopted metric. Let me explain the choice of adopted metric. 
So to start with in conformal geometry, uh, to study the scalar curvature, there is uh, this uh, second order uh, operator called conformal Laplace operator. This is a Laplace operator plus a potential function, which is a constant times the scalar curvature. And this, uh, I wouldn't go into detail, but this uh, uh, operator prescribes scalar curvature in a sense that if you have a metric G and if you have a conformal factor U to the four of D minus two power, then the LG of U capture the scalar curvature of this uh, conformal change of metric. So this is a well-known fact. And, and of course, solving R bar equal to constant is the famous Yamabe problem. And this kind of work has been extended to operators of order k when k is even and k less than or equal to d over two. And in, uh, the first such extension I know of is by Penites. And this is for the fourth order operator. And for any, and he also did it for dimension bigger than or equal to five. Such operator exists. And for general K, this is the famous work, what we call GJMS operator by four author, Grant, Jenny, Mason, and Spotty. So nowadays we just call it GJMS operator. So let me say a few words more about the Penites operator. Penites operator is a fourth order operator, start with by Laplace, and then plus in second order perturbation. So this there is the divergence, and this is the gradient. So we have a second order operator with its coefficient, the information of the metric G the Ricci G and the scalar G. And then there is a, like a, this a Laplace operator captures scalar curvature, the Penites operator captures some curvature called Q4. Okay. Notice this constant in the conformal Laplace has D minus two in it. So when D equal to two, the from the conformal Laplace, in this case, you only see minus Laplace. You do not know what is the scalar curvature. In this case, from two dimensions, that's the Gaussian curvature. So from the expression of conformal Laplace, you do not see Gaussian curvature when D equal to two. And same phenomena happen for fourth order operator. When D is bigger than or equal to five, you see that you op apply P4 to one, you capture uh, the curvature Q4. But this thing, the, for D equal to four, you cannot see what's the Q curvature from the operator, okay? But uh, that's why Penites uh, just stated his result for D bigger than equal to five. He said this is, has the same conformal covariant property by conformal Laplace and the prescribed Q curvature. And what is this Q curvature? Q curvature is a fourth order curvature. In a sense, you have scalar, second order, then you take Laplace of the scalar. So it's a fourth order plus a quadratic curvature term of Ricci and R, quadratic polynomial in terms of Ricci square, R square, and so on. So that's a Q for curvature. So the idea now we have is somehow P4 and Q4 replace conformal Laplace and scalar curvature and give some other conformal invariant of high order. So um, in a special case of uh, Einstein metric G plus, and if a Ricci G plus is this, uh, normalized to be D minus one G plus, one check to see 
is Q4 curvature is zero. Okay. And then this uh, P4 G plus, you plug in this formula and it turns out you can composite it into a uh, decompose into a composition of two second order coverage, uh, the operator. So it has this formula. So given all this, this suggests we think about the following, given a boundary metric on the boundary. And then what's the adopted metric? The adopted metric is defined by doing this. It's uh, not an obvious connection. By solving a Poisson equation in scattering theory, the Poisson operator is an operator which has this uh, uh, indices, S times D minus one minus S. You solve this PDE on XD with some kind of Dirichlet data. That's called Poisson equation. And it turns out if you make the right choice of S, S equal to D over two plus one, then this Poisson equation takes the form this way, just plug in S equal to D over two plus one. So we solve this PDE V and it turns out uh, you can assign the Dirichlet data as you want. You want G star restrict to the boundary is H that determine the boundary value of V. And then this G star, if you define to be this factor, then G star restrict to M equal to H. And then if we compare this equation three to one, we see that the piece P4 operate on G star is also again zero. So that shows Q4 of G star is also zero. Okay. So we make a wise choice so that this fourth order PDE is satisfied by our choice of metric Q. And it's naturally associated with a fourth order operator. And this all work for D bigger than or equal to five. When D equal to four, what happens? When D equal to four, we see that when D equal to four, this third equation becomes minus Laplace G plus V equal to zero, and which only has a trivial solution, V equal to constant. And that's not a metric we want to have this asymptotic behavior. So what happens is uh, this is related to scattering theory and also the fact that P4 has a, certain, a unique extension. So analytic extension. So in this case, we make an untrivial choice. And that is we look at solving this system of uh, this uh, equation, this uh, family of Poisson equation and for Vs. And then we analytically extend it to S equal to D minus one. So in this case, when S equal to D over two and D equal to four, then this is equal to three. That's the same index as D minus one in this particular case. So we take that extension, okay? And then uh, the equation I forgot to write down is this G plus W equal to D minus one. This is the PDE. And then the adopted metric we choose is E exponential two W G plus, okay, the extension. So this is an untrivial extension. And Bronson in 95 has extended the Penny's operator original defined for D bigger than or equal to five to D equal to four. Again, if one check, Bronson's extension, he has a reason. Bronson is arguing saying when D equal to four, Q4 should behave on four manifold, behaves like Gaussian curvature in two dimension. So Q4 is a geometric quantity which appear in Gauss-Bonnet formula. 
But if one check is extension, one can see Q4 G star again equal to zero with this choice. And let me also remark that is metric G star has been used for D equal to four in the early work by Pfefferman Graham and in the way later work by myself, Qingjie and Po Yang, and where we study this notion of renormalized volume of uh, hyperbolic, asymptotic hyperbolic or CC manifold for this metric also occur. For this case, reason, we call this particular metric in D equal to four, the fragment grand compatification okay, as a geometric compound. So the key property of this uh, uh, adopted metric G star is the following. One is a metric property we say is satisfied or PDE, so which is nice. And then uh, second is another property, a non-trivial property, which is pointed out in an early work of my show with Jeffrey Case. We say that under the condition, the scalar curvature on the boundary is positive. Not only this G star satisfy a fourth order PDE, but its scalar curvature is also positive on the boundary. Remember the early work of Qin Jie and Jack Li saying the boundary have positive scalar curvature. Then in the, then the interior metric, the interior is a positive Yamabe class. So there exists a metric of positive scalar curvature. And here we pointed out this G star has positive specific example of a positive scalar curvature. And what's the significance of the second result? The second result should be viewed this way. If we think about G star equal to rho square G plus, that's a compatified metric, then this condition scalar curvature positive translate to say the distance function of this conformal factor is always less than or equal to one. Okay, so this means that if we have sequence of metric, then uh, it's easier to talk about the limit of the metric because the distance function all bounded by one of this row i, okay, all bounded by one. So uh, for it's a useful result in deriving the convergence of the sequence of metric. So that's one key property. And the second thing was a proof. This uh, second result B was proof uh, using a uh, Li Qing's method and by continuation method along the Poisson equation. I will not go into detail. So it's another uh, analytic continuation method. Okay. So uh, now let me at least say a few words about the proof of this result. So the first result is the perturbation result. We say that if the boundary is compact and the interior, for example, has a vial D over two known small, then the interior metric is compact. So let me say some idea about the proof. Okay, so the setup now is we have a sequence of metric on the boundary, which is compact, and we have a sequence of interior compatification. And we want to say this in interior metric is compact. For example, we want to show that this interior metric have uniform curvature bound and what they call uniform injectivity radius lower bound. So the proof is a, a blow up argument, blow up analysis. Blow up usually means you assume it's false and then you rescale. And in the rescale metric, you show there's a compactness. And then uh, depends on what is the limiting of that rescale metric, you have some kind of Liouville theorem to reach a contract contradiction. 
that's called the flow of argument. So what we do is the following. So suppose it's not true, assume the country. Suppose this sequence of metric does not have a curvature bound. Then we rescale it. So this uh, G plus bar all have a uniform curvature bound, rescale it. And then in this rescale metric, this curvature is bounded. So by this uh, grow of compactness result, there's a limit. And this metric GI is uh, compact to start with. So the rescale metric would converge to the standard metric. So here we use assumption one, this HI is compact family to start with. And then we look at this rescale metric and we claim that it also converges. This GI has curvature bounded, it also converges. And then when it converges, we again saying such each this GI is CCE, then the limiting metric is also CCE. That is, it's conformal to an Einstein metric. And now we have some important condition that's followed from assumption two. That is, for this limiting metric, the vial D over two norm will tends to zero because we assume the contrary of compactness. So the limiting metric has vial equal to zero. We claim that this uses uh, the place where we use assumption two. And then in this case, we claim up to an isometry, this limiting metric is actually the model metric. The model metric is upper health space with the hyperbolic space. This uh, requires an argument, but uh, we can cancel to show that you are reaching a situation of hyperbolic metric. And then once we have the hyperbolic metric and something is conformal to the hyperbolic metric, we use the Liouville type PDE to say that that further pin down what is G infinity. Once you know G infinity plus is the hyperbolic metric, you come back to control the conformal factor to say it's log Y by some kind of uniqueness. You know there are two extension. One is the standard extension. The other is your extension and you say they are the same. So that's some kind of real view theorem. And then this is equal to this. And this reach a contradiction because we normalize the metric so that at each a mark point is one. So the limiting metric also should have the curvature equal to one at a certain point. And this G infinity now is the flat metric. That's the contradiction. But in this argument to reach this equal to one, we need some other condition. Suppose this is true for each GI and for the curvature of GI at some point equal to one. And we say the limiting is also at some certain point equal to one. We need more than the bounded of the curvature. We need to gain regularity. And so the key argument is how to gain this regularity to reach this condition, to reach this assumption, the curvature equal to one. And, and this is kind of argument is usually to epsilon regularity, that's gain of the regularity. So that means we need to say this G star, once say its curvature is bounded, its curvature the metric is actually in C2 alpha. From C2, you want C2 alpha. And that's always uh, the trick one to do is to say it satisfies an add additional elliptic system. So let me just uh, mention uh, briefly what is the elliptic system. So it turns out when D equal to four, we look at a metric called Bach tensor. Bach tensor, I don't have time to explain. Bach tensor is the critical point of this uh, uh, 
20 equal to two is uh, the vial square, the critical metric of this uh, in error. And the critical metric has Bach tensor equal to zero for this invariant. So that's called Bach tensor. When D equal to four, the Bach tensor is a pointwise conformal invariant, which vanishes for Einstein metric. But if it's conformal invariant and our G star is conformal to G plus, so if it vanishes for G plus, then it vanishes for G star. So B of G star equal to zero. That's the elliptic system. This metric is satisfied. And when D is uh, even, uh, when D bigger than four, it turns out the Bach tensor satisfies some condition and some PDE, which is related to the existence of some obstruction tensor. That's the tensor studied by Graham and Hirachi. This is a tensor which vanishes in Einstein metric and which also vanishes for metric conformal to uh, as this uh, property, OIJ equal to zero for conformal Einstein metric. So in this case, our Bach tensor also satisfies elliptic PDE. So this solved the problem for D equal to four and D even. And so it satisfies some additional elliptic system. I don't think I will have time to go into detail, but in general dimension, it turns out we can modify above by using some result related to gauge Einstein uh, condition. And that has been appear in the literature before to study this type of problem, which is uh, Einstein and conformal to Einstein. So there is another elliptic system, which is satisfied for G star. Okay. So let me skip some detail. So there is separate argument for even dimension, then things are easier to see. And for other dimension, we need more sophisticated tool. And now uh, let me uh, just say a few words about the uniqueness theorem. The uniqueness says that if you have two extension, then both this representative by the perturbation theorem conformal to the hyperbolic metric. So you have these two representative sequence both converge to this, but this coming from the same boundary. So this G star and the G theta star restrict to the boundary is the same. So that means that uh, to satisfy this uh, gauge Einstein equation. And from there, we apply the implicit function theorem to say they are unique up to diffeomorphism. So I'm sorry, I'm a bit sketching here. Okay, so this is. So let me, uh, the last five minutes, let me at least mention a general compactness result in four dimension, which is done in the early work. Okay, so instead of assuming the vial L2 known small, we have other condition. And that is recall that the Neumann data in this four dimensional setting is the Neumann derivative of the Ricci curvature. It turns out on four manifold with three dimension, this happened to any compact four manifold. There is an invariant. This invariant uh, is a third order invariant, which is the matching tensor with respect to Bach tensor. Bach tensor is on the interior, S tensor is on the boundary. And this is a pointwise conformal invariant. So this is uh, for all general four manifold. But in this case, for CCE manifold, this G3 agree with this S tensor. So this G3 has this pointwise conformal invariant condition. So in the model case, this uh, hyperbolic metric, our compatification is E2 WG3 
by solving this PDE and on the boundaries GC. Let me point it out, this PDE G star is not a flat metric, but there is this conformal factor exponential one minus X squared by, com by direct computation. And this metric turns out to have Q4 equal to zero and then S tensor also equal to zero. So on B4, there are actually two metrics with this property. One is uh, this uh, uh, with Q4 equal to zero. One is the flat metric, one is my G star metric. Okay. So G star is a nice representative, but it is not an obvious choice. So this is the example. So the statement of the theorem is the following. Suppose we have a on four manifold and we have a boundary condition on H. And suppose my S tensor for the sequence has the following assumption. That is, it's a weekly, locally weakly uh, in L1. Okay, the L1 now vanishes. Let me explain that condition later. And the topological assumption, then we reach the compactness. So uh, instead of explaining this condition two, the condition two is satisfied if my S tensor is bounded in LP for any P bigger than or equal to one, because it's a local condition. But uh, uh, the, I only need this uh, locally in a small ball. And then, but uh, on the other hand, the result is not satisfactory in a sense, only the L1 known of S is a uh, conformal invariant. Okay, so we impose condition two, which is not a natural condition in a sense, it's not a conformally invariant condition. So with this condition put on there, we have the compactness. And the condition two is to prevent boundary blow up. The condition three is to prevent interior blow up of the sequence. And my final remark is uh, my co-author Yu Xingji and I are uh, working hard to remove the second condition or replace it by condition S in L1. So this is an ongoing project and I thank very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very so much. that finishes my talk. Yeah. You, you, uh, people can show some, they can use the reactions. If you have any questions, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chang for a, a, a really fascinating talk. Um, I don't know if people have any questions. I know that we are almost out of time before the next talk, which starts in three minutes. But if anybody has any uh, questions or remarks, you can actually put them on the chat. Um, I don't see anybody. I have a quick question. Um, I just wanted to yeah, know if there was something. Would it, yes, I was just trying to understand a little bit more like a, if a, when you solve the Poisson equation to, to obtain the, the adopted metric, you mentioned before uh, for the measures bigger than five, I think it was that um, you need, need to do some spectral theory uh, on the manifold. I was just trying to understand a little bit more about that or, or if this is necessary and what information, what extra information this gives you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh... Yeah, uh, this is uh, better explained in a paper by Zosky and uh, Grant. And they okay. talk about the uh, constructive MS operator using this uh, Poisson equation in this asymptotic okay. hyperbolic setting. I can send you some reference. Okay, okay, yeah, that would be great. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah. So, uh, my comment just that people are saying very nice talk and thank you very much. Okay, bye. And I think, I think, okay. So let's thank the speaker again for a great talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Okay, thank you.
Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.